Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Nathan Shapura, Senior Political Advisor at the European People's Party. On behalf of the EPP, welcome to this episode of EPP Family Talks. This week, we have a special focus on the launch on the Conference on the Future of Europe, and we are very pleased to welcome with us Ava Maidel, President of the European Movement International and Chair of the EPP Group in the European Parliament's Young Members Network. Ava Maidel, thanks so much for joining us. This is, I know it's a holiday season for you in Bulgaria, uh, so thanks for joining us, and, and uh, it's a pleasure to speak with you for the second time now in this EPP Family Talk series. Absolutely. Thank you for having me. Very happy I'm able to join, and thanks for the invitation. Well, let's dive right in. When we spoke uh, almost exactly a year ago, I asked you about your Twitter handle, uh, also as a way to promote your Twitter handle, and you had on there uh, the, two, the two words, passionate and proud, and you still have those two words on your Twitter handle, so I want to ask you, after uh, more than a year now in this pandemic with lots of ups and downs, what at this point uh, in 2021, in the spring of 2021, what would you say at this point Europe has to be passionate and proud about and what, what needs to be done still? Um, well, I think it's a very important time um, for the Brussels bubble institutions, but hopefully this hype that is surrounding the Conference of the Future of Europe uh, will be well translated um, into our regions and into Europe's capitals. So what Europe can be proud is that it once again, I think it proved useful in, so in solving real life problems. Um, a year ago, uh, when we spoke, uh, we saw how the pandemic stretched. Uh, back then, it was particularly the Italian healthcare system to its limits, basically. And the EU was very, um, you know, uh, well organized to deploy medical professionals from other countries. When businesses in the same time uh, all over the continent had to close down due to the lockdown, the European Union also very swiftly approved financial support for them. If you look at the vaccination rates, we all want those vaccination rates to be the best. But if you compare Europe to South America, Asia or Africa, you could see that Europe once again has proven its purpose to provide European citizens with basically the fastest and widest opportunities to get protection uh, from the virus. So these are not just theoretical merits of the European integration, but actually cases of practical help. Um, and why I think we need to be passionate, apart from being proud Europeans, is because I think Europe is out there to listen. And the conferences are yet another example. Because we are not blind, we are neither deaf, also as an EPP party and an EPP group, to the problems of Europeans. Um, and with this start uh, of the conference, I think we could show that we've learned the lessons. We are there to listen carefully to every voice. Um, you don't have to be the loudest or the largest. Um, we need to also listen to specific voices, to smaller and weaker voices, because only by taking them into account, I think those conferences uh, will be legitimate uh, and could lead to actual change, hence contributing to more Europeans passionate about Europe. I think that perspective you offer with regards to vaccinations is so helpful um, to really pan out and look at the global situation and, and how Europe how well Europe has done also on vaccinations with regards to the global situation or compared compared to the rest of the world. And you hit on, I think, with the Conference on the Future of Europe, exactly the theme we're stressing this week in this special series, which is listening, listening to citizens. And so I wanted to ask you about um, the, the things you're working on and how citizens can be involved in the specific areas that, that you're working on. And maybe the first thing uh, I would ask you about, since you, you, are, you, you mentioned also listening to citizens and maybe more more smaller places or places farther from Brussels, let's say, or farther from the from the center of where things are happening. Uh, you're, you're a young MEP yourself, you're chair of the EPP group in the European Parliament's Young Members Network. So how, how can the Conference on the Future of Europe incorporate particularly young voices and voices from places that are not sort of uh, in Brussels, let's say, or not in, at, the, at the center of where we typically think decisions being made, let's say, at the European level? Well, so first of all, I think um, I just gave you more practical um, examples. So I think we need to be a little bit more practical. We need to have substantial subjects that will interest citizens um, and basically make them excited to share their opinion. Um, we need to keep the talk about the balance of power and institutional setup uh, for 
later stage of the conference. So that should not be our aim and expectations from citizens. Um, so secondly, it is absolutely crucial we involve the next generation Europeans. Um, the young people um, have to be, uh, you know, critical. They have to be maybe also positive, but they have to be honest about the way they see the path of Europe going forward because they're part of this path. The path of going forward with our policies uh, is not going to be just a side path to the ones young people are walking. It's a common path together. Um, so I think the way we could engage them is by having more regional initiatives. Um, better attendance will really be key for this event. Um, and how can we ensure that the, the young people people participate, maybe by making sure there are some of the initiators of those meetings and these conferences. Um, you know, also looking at the platform of the conference, uh, it's such a, you know, it's like a social media platform. You can not only follow uh, or lead, but you could create and set the agenda. So it would be important if more citizens do that from all walks of life and all age groups uh, and all uh, geographical representation. But really, I count very much on inspiring Europeans, on the next generation of Europeans to help us walk that path together. You've just mentioned something which I want to use to liaise to the next question, and that is the social media platform. Uh, you were involved, uh, you're a member of the E-Trade Committee, the Committee on Industry Research and, and Energy, and also a member of the Parliament's now Special Committee on Artificial Intelligence in a Digital Age. And the reason I, I think of this in, in relation to what you've just said, we, we often associate young people with you know, the, the, the digital future, of course, the digital future is not just about young people, but maybe they're the first group that comes to mind when it comes to, to new platforms and new technologies. One of the new technologies is artificial intelligence. How do you think, um, what are the main challenges now with regards to new technologies like AI, and how can citizens have a better role or stronger role in forming EU policies on these new kind of cutting edge technologies? Okay, well, I think the most important thing um, to keep in mind when we speak about technologies and citizens and this sort of conversation that we're about to have about the future is to uh, make sure citizens uh, trust technologies. Um, if they trust technologies, they will want to see more technological advancements that could assist in their daily lives that could help their businesses prosper, grow or perform better. Um, but in order to get that trust, I think it will be important to tell stories, uh, but also ask for those stories to be told by citizens. Um, because I think citizens could share their vision for the tech future of Europe also throughout the citizens platform or the conference of the future of Europe. Uh, these could be the vehicles uh, to find these workable solutions to receive more, more attention. Um, tech leadership in Europe is not some sort of a zero-sum game because our economies are interconnected. If we take a uh, Dutch company, for example, uh, that becomes a global leader in robotics, uh, this global company will drive forward plenty of other European tech companies, some of them micro, smaller or middle sized companies. It will boost hardware or software suppliers. It will facilitate exchange of know how and basically attract more investments in the sector. So we need to uh, see our digital future uh, in, in from various aspects. And I think everyone has a place in that future. But we need to start from 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 you know the basis, uh, and that is uh, trust. It's both the basis of building those future technologies, and it's the basic of gaining citizens' uh, trust. The, the key words that I just took away from your answer there were trust, building trust, um, telling stories, and making sure everybody finds a place in that story, or that everybody's story is in, is involved or incorporated in that uh, in the broader story. So one final question on the conference on the future of Europe relating to what you're specifically working on, and that is uh, with regards to your role as president of the European Movement International. The uh, EMI is um, a civil society organization, the largest pan-European network of, I'm just reading here the, 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 the bio sort of from the website, the largest pan-European network of pro-European organizations 
You're present in 34 countries, uh, encompassing 38 international associations with lots of business trade unions, NGOs, political parties, um, academia, et cetera. How can EMI, how can other similar organizations be a part of the, of the Conference on the Future of Europe? Um, so, first of all, thank you for uh, bringing uh, the very broad platform the European Movement International represents. It's a, it's a unique organization uh, from uh, where one could learn a lot about the various perspectives. Uh, yet, in the same time, we all being uh, binded together um, in uh, being uh, convinced pro-Europeans. Um, so there are two main ways in which the European movement is playing a leading role in this conference. The first being promoting our policy ideas for the future of Europe that have been created in consultation with all these member organizations um, coming all around um, um, Europe um, and with various backgrounds. The second is by connecting with citizens and encouraging their active participation in this process. We have our local organizations um, and they really really reach the grassroots uh, from, again, all walks of life, uh, which is the beauty of, of the organization. Um, so we would like to be an amplifier for citizens' concerns and ideas so that they are heard by decision makers. Um, the conference cannot just be a talking shop. Uh, it basically uh, needs to deliver on what citizens actually care about. Uh, and to use the word that I would prefer, the things that citizens are passionate about. Um, and if you want to play a constructive role in this conference, uh, one has to really be active. Um, join the event, reach out to the members of parliament, both national and European, that they're part of the conference, go to the event, set up your own events on the platform, um, just so that you could have a feel whether your idea is largely accepted or not. But sometimes maybe even an idea that initially is not largely accepted could be a very successful idea. One never knows. Um, I think that's why it's really important to listen to one another um, and to exchange views and ideas. It's, it's a crucial time um, for, for the European institutions. Well, thanks so much, as always, for the clarity of your explanations. I think very important uh, as we approach this conference, launch of the conference on, on the future of Europe. But also, thanks so much for the passion, indeed, with which you always express uh, express your ideas. So I wanted to ask you a question which I asked you a year ago, and that is with uh, whether there's any book or film or series you might recommend. I know a year ago I asked you this question and you referenced what seemed to me like um, a really fun thing, which is some kind of an MEP book club heading into the summer. So heading now into the summer again uh, in the next several weeks, is there something you would you would recommend to us? Um, well, I would refer to uh, the latest uh, documentary movie that I started watching, but I haven't finished that yet. But so far, I find it uh, very interesting. And it's not really related that much to politics or even not at all, uh, but it's an inspiring uh, story. Um, it's about the creator of the Vespa. I'm a big fan of uh, of of the Vespa motorcycle um, and it's available on Netflix. It's about uh, the person Piaggio who started uh, the company in very difficult um, a moment um, many years ago. And it was beautifully made so far from what I saw. And I think it probably has quite some inspiration about the difficulties one faces and uh, how you could turn uh, you know, an idea into, into success. So I hope to finish it next weekend um, and uh, I hope that my recommendation wouldn't be bad because I after all haven't finished watching the, the, the full film. <laughs> well thanks for that and the first thing that comes to mind is what more what more quintessential symbol of summer than the Vespa. So uh, one final question and that is as we approach now the launch of the conference on the future of Europe when you think of Europe uh, yourself what one word comes to mind? Um, well, look, um, I mean, um, there's many words I could describe Europe, but if I think about it in the sense of the conference, uh, the way I would like for us to design uh, Europe uh, after this conference is to aim to make Europe a better Europe. Um, so this, the whole exercise is not to debate what was wrong or bad or, or what we want to do, but the outcome has to result in a better Europe, more efficient Europe, uh, a Europe that delivers. So better Europe, Europe that delivers. 
Eva Maidel, President of the European Movement International and Chair of the EPP Group in the European Parliament's Young Members Network. Thanks so much once again for taking the time to speak with us. It's always a pleasure speaking with you on behalf of the EPP. Thanks so much for the work that you're doing. Thank you, Nathan, and to the EPP party for this opportunity. As always, I enjoyed it. To all of our viewers, thanks for tuning in. Please join us again next time for our next episode of EPP Family Talks. See you then.